Hello, my name is Sarah Larson and I am the Executive Director of AWAKE, a community of abuse survivors, concerned Catholics and allies responding to the wounds of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. I will tell you a little bit more about myself and about AWAKE in a moment. But first, I want to thank you for making the time to engage with this painful topic. I know that sometimes it might feel easier not to think about the reality and impact of abuse in the church, but I appreciate your willingness to approach this topic with both compassion and courage. I also want to offer a gentle caution about the content of this talk. I won't be speaking about specific details of abuse, but this discussion could still be difficult to hear, especially if you are carrying your own experiences of trauma. Please take care of yourself and feel free to step away at any time if you need to. Your well-being matters. At a conference I attended recently, a woman advocating on behalf of marginalized people described herself as a servant of the story. And that really resonated with me as someone who has had the privilege to be a witness to the sacred stories of so many men and women who have experienced sexual abuse by Catholic leaders. I feel a responsibility to bring their voices to others, to you. So I want to begin with a story, which I'm sharing with the permission of this beautiful survivor, using a pseudonym to protect her privacy. I'm just going to give you three shop snapshots of Nicole over the last year. So Nicole first reached out to me through a short, terse email, just a few sentences, asking about AWAKE's resources for survivors. She was just beginning to process the clergy sexual abuse she experienced as a child and again as an adult. The first time we spoke on Zoom, I could see the fear and anxiety just radiating off of her. She told me she was struggling and looking for an anchor. So that's the first snapshot. Here's the next. Six months later, at Awake's weekend retreat for abuse survivors, I met Nicole in person for the first time. When she stepped out of the car, I greeted her warmly and she could barely manage a smile and a hello. Her whole body was stiff in this stance of self-protection. That first night, Nicole was in my small group circle and she shared how hard it was for her to show up here and that she really wasn't even sure if she wanted to stay. But she decided to come anyway and to give this a try. Finally, I want to share one more moment from Nicole at the closing circle of our retreat. We went around the circle and invited each person, if they wanted, to share one gift, grace, or glimmer of hope they experienced over the course of the weekend. Nicole was actually one of the first people to share, and she looked like a completely different person than the one I met on Zoom six months ago, or the woman who showed up to the retreat gripped with fear. Nicole was just glowing, radiating light and joy. And she told us what changed. So first, a little bit of context. Many of the abuse survivors that we accompany have a desire for reconciliation and healing with the church and with the priesthood in particular. Not all of them, of course, but enough that on this retreat, we wanted to create an opportunity for a healing encounter with a compassionate, trauma-informed priest in an environment that would feel as safe as possible. So we had a few hours where priests were available to speak with the retreatants individually. Some survivors wanted to receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation, while others just wanted to talk to a priest, to share their anger and hurt, to speak about their story, to hear some words of apology or compassion from a priest. It was completely up to them, and we made sure the priests were prepared to listen to whatever they would hear. As you can see in this photo, we had pair of, pairs of chairs set up outside, far enough from the building that no one could hear what was being said, 
but also in a wide open space under the trees that would feel as safe and calming as possible. We told the priests to be careful not to lean in too close to the survivors or make any movements to touch a hand or shoulder in blessing. So we did as much as possible to make this feel safe. But of course, it can still be a very scary thing for someone who is so deeply betrayed by a priest. Well, I assumed Nicole would not want anything to do with a priest on this day. She is no longer Catholic and is very triggered by any religious symbols or language. But Nicole actually signed up for a time to talk with one of the priests. And at that closing circle of the retreat, she told us what happened. She sat down with Father Tom and was having a conversation with him. I don't know about what exactly. When out of the corner of her eye, she saw something moving in the grass near Father Tom's foot. Now, Nicole is a pretty outdoorsy person, so she just said calmly, Father Tom, there's a snake by your foot. And apparently, Father Tom really, really does not like snakes. And he jumped out of his seat and yelped a bit. And Nicole, without thinking, instinctively grabbed his hand to calm him. She was comforting Father Tom, telling him the snake was just slithering away. And they both looked down at their hands clasped together and just started laughing. Now, I don't know where the conversation went after that, but that moment of human encounter had a profound impact on Nicole, along with the deep sharing in our circles and the experience of community with other survivors throughout the retreat. Nicole just kept on glowing as we said goodbye from the retreat. And these are the words she shared on her feedback form afterwards. Nicole said, my experience was transformative. Out of the depths of pain comes the flower of change, bathed in the sun of the beloved shining on my face. How can I not be grateful? The moments of holding holy space in quiet reverence for our process were a blessing. Your intention as healers were Holy Spirit driven and that intention held me in my fear and skepticism until they were distilled into gratitude. So that's the final snapshot I want to give you of Nicole, leaving the retreat center with a huge smile on her face, hugging everyone and already looking forward to reuniting in one of Awake's online survivor circles the next month. I will return to Nicole at the end of this talk and share something I have learned from her. But now I want to just step back and tell you a little bit about myself and about Awake. Awake is a big, beautiful, diverse community that has been built by so many survivors, concerned Catholics and allies working together on this shared mission. And each person has their own story of what led them to this ministry but I thought it might be helpful to share a bit of my own personal story first and the ways that it is part of the bigger story of Awake. Five years ago, I never could have imagined where I would be today, but I am here because of the working of the Holy Spirit who changed my life and put me on a path I never would have expected. I'm also here and speaking with you in a spirit of humility believing I have something of value to offer, but also recognizing my limitations. I do not have lived experience of sexual abuse by a Catholic leader. I'm not a mental health professional or an expert on these issues. What I do offer is the honor of having walked with and listened to more than a hundred survivors over the past few years and walking with many of these people on an ongoing basis through Awake Survivor Circles and other programs. So that's what I can share with you today. I also know there might be survivors listening to, the, to this talk and they are the real experts on this topic. I am only a servant of the stories. So in 2018, I was a devout cradle Catholic working in parish ministry in a job that I loved. 
I was also a person who had never really thought deeply about the issue of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. I think that, at least subconsciously, I believed this narrative that I think is really common among many Catholics. And it goes something like this. Sexual abuse in the Catholic Church is a sad problem. It's something that happened a long time ago, and it was horrible. But then when we found out about it, maybe in 2002 in the Boston spotlight years, when we found out about it as a church, we all came together and we fixed the problem. And now we don't have to think about it anymore. I don't think I ever would have said that out loud, but subconsciously, that's probably how I thought about this issue. Then the summer of 2018, which was the McCarrick, um, the McCarrick scandal, the Pennsylvania grand jury report, and all of that news really just hit me like a punch in the gut. And for whatever reason, that is the moment that I was ready to listen, um, to learn, to have God wake me up to this reality. And I knew at that time that I had to do something. And that something is what led me to today. So I spent the fall of 2019 thinking and talking and reading and listening to survivor stories and praying and crying. And ultimately I left my job in parish ministry and I started writing a blog and ultimately started connecting with other Catholics who cared about this issue and were wanting to do something. And so Awake really began with a small circle of Catholics gathered in my living room, feeling compelled to take responsibility. We were looking at the harm that had been done and we, how we could be part of repairing that harm. So our first action was our open letter to survivors, which was designed as just a small gesture of solidarity and support that was really inspired by reading apologies from some bishops and church leaders that really didn't seem to capture the seriousness of the problem or um, our real need for deep um, repentance. So we wrote that letter not really knowing what kind of impact it might have, but thinking there's something that we need to do. And at the beginning, really, we were just listening and learning. We tried to begin with a from a place of humility and just start to think about what small steps we could take as this tiny little community of Catholics in Milwaukee. Now, just a few years later, Awake has become a nationwide community of abuse survivors, concerned Catholics and allies working together for awakening, transformation and healing. The reality is the body of Christ is deeply wounded and needs deep healing. We also recognize that it's very difficult for those who have been wounded by church leaders to come to church institutions for healing. We need third spaces where people of faith can reach out with the love of Christ, but in a way that is not controlled by the institution that caused the harm. And this is really what AWAKE is. I also think a parish community or other Catholic organization can be this kind of third space for those who may not trust diocesan leaders, but might be open to a smaller local community. There is so much that AWAKE does from our courageous conversations, online speaker and discussion series, to our virtual and in-person prayer events, to a weekly blog and monthly feature with survivors telling their stories in their own words, to working with parishes to become more trauma-informed and sensitive. But really the heart of AWAKE's work is listening to and walking with abuse survivors in a ministry of accompaniment. We have about 45 survivors participate in, participating in one of AWAKE's five survivor circles this year, and many more engaged with AWAKE in other ways. So today, I mostly want to focus on what we have learned from these amazing people. So I'm gonna spend the rest of our time together walking through six things we can all learn from listening to survivors. 
The first and maybe most important point I want to share is that every person is unique. You know, sometimes people ask me, what do survivors want or what will survivors think about X, Y, or Z? And there's just no one answer to that. On this slide, you can see photos of just a few of the survivors who are part of the AWAKE community and have chosen to make their names and faces public. Each one of these people is a unique human being. No two stories or journeys are alike. In AWAKE, we walk with survivors who are devout Catholics and those who want nothing to do with the Catholic Church and everything in between. There are people who have experienced decades of addiction and failed relationships and self-destructive behavior in the aftermath of their abuse and people who have always looked like they have it all together. There are some that are very liberal, others that are very conservative, both regarding politics and church affairs. There are people who pour their hearts out to me the first time we talk and people who take a long time to trust us enough to share much. There are people who have spoken very publicly and taken every possible step to hold their abuser accountable. And there are people who have never told anyone what happened. So the first thing I want to make sure you understand is that when you've met one survivor, you've met one survivor. And it's really important that all of us not stereotype or make assumptions. So every survivor is unique, but I will say that there does seem to be one common thread among everyone I talk to, and that is we all want to be welcomed, valued, and believed. Now that is true, I think, of every human being. And so that maybe shouldn't be a surprise, but you know, this is something we all want, but abuse often takes this away from people. We all have this desire to be believed, to be listened to, to, to be treated as a valuable human being. And it's a gift to offer this through AWAKE for each survivor to know that they are valued and to realize they are not alone. It's also a gift that I think a welcomes, welcoming, supportive parish community or other small Catholic community can offer to survivors and it's maybe the first and most important gift we can give. The third thing I think we can learn from listening to survivors is that our language matters. The way that we talk about this issue can help people feel included and affirmed or cause additional harm. You know, when people think about the abuse crisis, they often think of men who were abused when they were altar servers decades ago. And that is certainly part of the story. But the issue of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church is much more than that. It's not just abuse of men, but also women. It's not abuse only by priests, but also by deacons, relig religious brothers and sisters and lay leaders. It includes people not just abused as children and teens, but those abused as adults. When we picture an abuse survivor, the face that we picture is often white, but we also know that there are likely many survivors in communities of color who face additional barriers to reporting and whose st stories are just not being told. I'll also note that AWAKE primarily uses the word survivor to refer to those who have experienced sexual abuse by Catholic leaders, because it's the term that most in our community prefer. But not everyone identifies with that term. Some prefer to be called victim or victim survivor or to avoid any labels at all. Beyond these realities, our language matters in the way that we talk about this issue because it's not just abuse, but also the cover-up, the way that the church has handled it. When Awake speaks about the full reality of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, we mean all of that. Sometimes we might call it the twin crises of abuse and institutional betrayal, and recognize that when we talk about this issue, we have to address both pieces. 
I also want to recognize that it's not only survivors who are wounded, also family members, friends, community members, and the whole church and society. So when we speak about the wounds of abuse in the church, we mean all of those things. I've actually spoken to survivors about that phrase that is often used, the sexual abuse crisis, and have learned that even those words can sometimes feel hurtful. One survivor explained it to me this way and said that the way that we talk about the abuse crisis often seems to convey that the real problem is not that I was abused or the years of pain I have experienced since that abuse. The real problem is that people found out about it and it has caused problems for the church's image as if that is more important than the lifelong wounds of that abuse. So those are just a few examples, small ways of um, recognizing that our language matters in the way that we talk about abuse. The fourth point I want to make is that these wounds have not been healed. I want to make very, very clear that people are still suffering deeply today. And I also want to acknowledge that you listening to this talk may be one of those people who are suffering. You know, I talk all the time to people who are still in deep pain, some of whom want nothing to do with the church and some who remain practicing Catholics, who often feel like the church has left them behind and stopped caring. I talk to people who have never told anyone their story. I spoke with a woman recently who was assaulted in the confessional 40 years ago and never told anyone until she reached out to awake. There's someone else that I'm speaking with whose brother recently reported his abuse for the first time and he, his whole family is in agony as his, the way he has been treated by the diocese has just been terrible. We work with women who have experienced sexual abuse as adults, many in the last 10 years, and their experiences are so often excruciating. One of my favorite verses in the Bible comes from 1 Corinthians 12 in the passage where Paul is writing about the body of Christ. And the last verse of that section he says, when one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And when I think about that description, I think if one part of the body is suffering, has experienced abuse and is still suffering from those wounds, and we, those in the body of Christ who don't have that direct experience of abuse, if we can't feel the pain, then that's a sign that the body isn't working properly. It really should be true that when one part of the body of Christ is suffering, that we all suffer together. One survivor I spoke with said that it feels like the church is trying to put a Band-Aid on an infected wound that has never been treated or healed. Father Hans Zollner, who is one of the Pope Francis's key advisors on abuse, spoke at an Awake event in 2023 and he said that addressing abuse in the church is the task of generations. That's generations, plural. And we are only just at the beginning of dealing with this. So anytime that we as church feel tempted to think that this issue is over, that we have fixed it, I want us to remember that these wounds have not been healed. I am very grateful for all of the supportive priests who are engaged with AWAKE and in their own local communities to address the issue of abuse. But I want to speak now specifically to lay people and to tell you all that lay people are part of the problem and part of the solution. I think it can be easy for us to think about this as a problem for the clergy to deal with. But I've learned from survivors that some of the most harmful things that are said and done are said and done by lay people. Lay people are often defensive of priests and not supportive of victims. 
They say things like, why can't they just move on? Or they are only in it for the money. It can be a temptation to treat victim survivors and those who advocate for them as enemies of the church or troublemakers, especially if they are seeking justice or pushing for accountability. It can also be tempting for people to use survivors for our own agendas in the church. And this can be incredibly hurtful. These are human beings with real stories and real pain, not pawns used to an adva advance an agenda. I also know that there can be a lot of harm caused by people who may be well-intentioned but are not trauma-informed and can ca sometimes cause hurt unintentionally. So those are all realities in which lay people can be part of the problem in the church today. But I also believe that there's a lot that we can do to be part of the solution. A big part of it is just showing up, not being afraid to wade into these difficult issues like you are doing today. You know, many survivors feel like Catholics just don't care anymore, don't want to think about these issues anymore. So even just listening and engaging with these conversations is important. I think the key is to realize that we can't just wait for someone else to take care of this. We can make a real difference and we have a real responsibility. I think we can make the biggest difference if we start by listening to and opening our hearts to survivors. And I'm going to share a few more concrete ideas on that in just a moment. I want to return now to Nicole, who I told you about at the beginning of this talk. So one final thing that I have learned from Nicole and from so many other survivors that I have walked with is that healing really is possible. You know, since the retreat, Nicole has remained engaged with Awake, participating in our survivor circles, and even taking a brave step to help educate priests by sharing her story with them. I have seen incredible growth and healing in her over the past two years. I also want to be honest and say that it's not easy. Healing is not a process that is ever complete, and there are lots of bumps and setbacks along the way. But real progress can happen in individual lives and I believe in the church as a whole. So I know some of what I've shared today might be hard to hear, but I also want to end with this reassurance. I have seen firsthand that transformation can happen when people are received with compassion by people who are not afraid to enter into the mess and pain of their stories. And when communities come together in a spirit of honesty and courage to face these hard realities. I've also seen the amazing gifts that survivors have to offer the church. I have personally learned so much from their wisdom and faith and resilience. They have a lot to teach our church about abuse and the failures of our current systems, but also about what it means to seek God in the midst of suffering, to find light in the midst of darkness, to understand the meaning of the cross and the resurrection. God is doing amazing things. Transformation and healing are possible for individuals, for communities, and for our whole church. So I believe we have good reason to hope. I know that some of you listening today might be wondering at this point, what can I do? So I want to leave you with just a few ideas of places that you can start. The first thing I would say is to educate yourself about abuse, trauma, and the latest developments on this issue globally, nationally, and in your own diocese. We can only do better if we are well-informed. I would also encourage you to be mindful about how you speak about these issues. And don't be afraid to speak up if you hear a priest or a lay minister or, or any fellow Catholic talking about these issues in a harmful way. Be mindful that all the words we speak 
should be able to be heard by a survivor and they shouldn't be hurt by the words that we are saying. I'd encourage you to think about advocating for small changes in your own parish or local community. You know, these can be very simple things like including the survivors, um, survivors in petitions at mass on a regular basis. Of course, I invite you to engage with and support organizations like AWAKE that accompany and empower survivors. And finally, I would just encourage you to keep showing up, keep paying attention, even when this issue is not in the headlines, because there is a lot of work to be done and we need a sustained, uh, concentrated attention on this issue over the long term to make a real difference. Thank you for taking the time to listen today, to open your heart to what we as Catholics can learn from abuse survivors and to consider what you might be called to do in response. We have a lot of work to do to become a church of safety, accountability, and compassion. But I truly believe there is great hope when we are open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and we undertake this work together. Thank you.